The Story of Civilization, Volume 6, The Reformation, by Will Durant. Part 1. Continued. Cassette 8, Side 2. How did the people of Spain react to the Inquisition? The upper classes and the educated minority faintly opposed it. The Christian populace usually approved it. The crowds that gathered at the autos de fe showed little sympathy, often active hostility to the victims. In some places they tried to kill them, lest confession should let them escape the pyre. Christians flocked to buy at auction the confiscated goods of the condemned. How numerous were the victims? Llorente estimated them from 1480 to 1488 at 8,800 burned, 96,494 punished. From 1480 to 1808, at 31,912 burned, 291,450 heavily penanced. These figures were mostly guesses and are now generally rejected by Protestant historians as extreme exaggerations. A Catholic historian reckons 2,000 burnings between 1480 and 1504 and 2,000 more to 1758. Isabella's secretary, Hernando de Pulgar, calculated the burnings at 2,000 before 1490. Surita, a secretary of the Inquisition, boasted that it had burned 4,000 in Seville alone. There were victims, of course, in most Spanish cities, even in Spanish dependencies like the Baleares, Sardinia, Sicily, the Netherlands, America. The rate of burnings diminished after 1500. But no statistics can convey the terror in which the Spanish mind lived in those days and nights. Men and women, even in the secrecy of their families, had to watch every word they uttered, lest some stray criticism should lead them to an Inquisition jail. It was a mental oppression unparalleled in history. Did the Inquisition succeed? Yes, in attaining its declared purpose, to rid Spain of open heresy. The idea that the persecution of beliefs is always ineffective is a delusion. It crushed the Albigensians and Huguenots in France, the Catholics in Elizabethan England, the Christians in Japan. It stamped out in the 16th century the small groups that favored Protestantism in Spain. On the other hand, it probably strengthened Protestantism in Germany, Scandinavia, and England by arousing in their peoples a vivid fear of what might happen to them if Catholicism were restored. It is difficult to say what share the Inquisition had in ending the brilliant period of Spanish history from Columbus to Velázquez, from 1492 to 1660. The peak of that epoch came with Cervantes, 1547 to 1616, and Lope de Vega, 1562 to 1635, after the Inquisition had flourished in Spain for a hundred years. The Inquisition was an effect as well as a cause of the intense and exclusive Catholicism of the Spanish people, and that religious mood had grown during centuries of struggle against infidel Moors. The exhaustion of Spain by the wars of Charles V and Philip II, and the weakening of the Spanish economy by the victories of Britain on the sea and the mercantile policies of the Spanish government, may have had more to do with the decline of Spain than the terrors of the Inquisition. The executions for witchcraft in northern Europe and New England showed in Protestant peoples a spirit akin to that of the Spanish Inquisition, which, strange to say, sensibly treated witchcraft as a delusion to be pitied and cured rather than punished. Both the Inquisition and the witch-burning were expressions of an age afflicted with homicidal certainty in theology, as the patriotic massacres of our era may be due in part to homicidal certainty in ethnic or political theory. We must try to understand such movements in terms of their time, but they seem to us now the most unforgivable of historic crimes. A supreme and unchallengeable faith is a deadly enemy to the human mind. 6. In Exit to Israel The Inquisition was intended to frighten all Christians, new or old, into at least eternal orthodoxy, in the hope that heresy would be blighted in the bud, and that the second or third generation of baptized Jews would forget the Judaism of their ancestors. There was no intent to let baptized Jews leave Spain. When they tried to emigrate, Ferdinand and the Inquisition forbade it. But what of the unbaptized Jews? Some 235,000 of them remained in Christian Spain. How could the religious unity of the nation be affected if these were allowed to practice and profess their faith? Torquemada thought it impossible and recommended their compulsory conversion or their banishment. Ferdinand hesitated. 
He knew the economic value of Hebrew ability in commerce and finance, but he was told that the Jews taunted the conversos and sought to win them back to Judaism, if only secretly. His physician, Rebus Altus, a baptized Jew, was accused of wearing on a pendant from his neck a golden ball containing a representation of himself in the act of desecrating a crucifix. The charge seems incredible, but the physician was burned in 1488. Letters were forged in which a Jewish leader in Constantinople advised the head of the Jewish community in Spain to rob and poison Christians as often as possible. A converso was arrested on the charge of having a consecrated wafer in his knapsack. He was tortured again and again until he signed a statement that six conversos and six Jews had killed a Christian child to use its heart in a magic ceremony designed to cause the death of all Christians and the total destruction of Christianity. The confessions of the tortured man contradicted one another, and no child was reported missing. However, four Jews were burned, two of them after having their flesh torn away with red-hot pincers. These and similar accusations may have influenced Ferdinand. In any case, they prepared public opinion for the expulsion of all unbaptized Jews from Spain. When Granada surrendered on November 5, 1491, and the industrial and commercial activities of the Moors accrued to Christian Spain, the economic contribution of the unconverted Jews no longer seemed vital. Meanwhile, popular fanaticism, inflamed by autos de fe and the preaching of the friars, was making social peace impossible unless the government either protected or expelled the Jews. On March 30, 1492, so crowded a year in Spanish history, Ferdinand and Isabella signed the Edict of Exile. All unbaptized Jews of whatever age or condition were to leave Spain by July 31st, and were never to return on penalty of death. In this brief period they might dispose of their property at whatever price they could obtain. They might take with them movable goods and bills of exchange, but no currency, silver, or gold. Abraham Senor and Isaac Abrabanel offered the sovereigns a large sum to withdraw the edict, but Ferdinand and Isabella refused. No royal accusation was made against the Jews except their tendency to lure conversos back to Judaism. A supplementary edict required that taxes to the end of the year should be paid on all Jewish property and sales. Debts due from Christians or Moors were to be collected only at maturity, through such agents as the banished creditors might find, or these claims could be sold at a discount to Christian purchasers. In this enforced precipitancy, the property of the Jews passed into Christian hands at a small fraction of its value. A house was sold for an ass, a vineyard for a piece of cloth. Some Jews, in despair, burned down their homes— to collect insurance. Others gave them to the municipality. Synagogues were appropriated by Christians and transformed into churches. Jewish cemeteries were turned into pasturage. In a few months, the largest part of the riches of the Spanish Jews, accumulated through centuries, melted away. Approximately 50,000 Jews accepted conversion and were permitted to remain. Over 100,000 left Spain in a prolonged and melancholy exodus. Before departing, they married all their children who were over twelve years of age. The young helped the old, the rich succored the poor. The pilgrimage moved on horses or asses, in carts or on foot. At every turn, good Christians, clergy and laity, appealed to the exiles to submit to baptism. The rabbis countered by assuring their followers that God would lead them to the promised land by opening a passage through the sea, as he had done for their fathers of old. The emigrants who gathered in Cadiz waited hopefully for the waters to part and let them march dry-shod to Africa. Disillusioned, they paid high prices for transport by ship. Storms scattered their fleet of twenty-five vessels. Sixteen of these were driven back to Spain, where many desperate Jews accepted baptism as no worse than seasickness. Fifty Jews, shipwrecked near Seville, were imprisoned for two years and then sold as slaves. The thousands who sailed from Gibraltar Malaga, Valencia, or Barcelona found that in all Christendom only Italy was willing to receive them with humanity. The most convenient goal of the pilgrims was Portugal. A large population of Jews already existed there, and some had risen to wealth and political position under friendly kings. But John II was frightened by the number of Spanish Jews, perhaps 80,000, who poured in. He granted them a stay of eight months, after which they were to leave. Pestilence broke out among them and spread to the Christians, who demanded their immediate expulsion. John facilitated the departure of the immigrant Jews by providing ships at low cost, but those who confided themselves to these vessels were subjected to robbery and rape. Many were cast upon desolate shores and left to die of starvation, 
were to be captured and enslaved by Moors. One shipload of 250 Jews, being refused at port after port because pestilence still raged among them, wandered at sea for four months. Biscayan pirates seized one vessel, pillaged the passengers, then drove the ships into Malaga, where the priests and magistrates gave the Jews a choice of baptism or starvation. After fifty of them had died, the authorities provided the survivors with bread and water and bade them sail for Africa. When the eight months of grace had expired, John II sold into slavery those Jewish immigrants who still remained in Portugal. Children under fifteen were taken from their parents and were sent to the St. Thomas Islands to be reared as Christians. As no appeals could move the executors of the decree, some mothers drowned themselves and their children rather than suffer their separation. John's successor, Manuel, gave the Jews a breathing spell. He freed those whom John had enslaved, forbade the preachers to incite the populace against the Jews, and ordered his courts to dismiss as malicious tales all allegations of the murder of Christian children by Jews. But meanwhile Manuel courted Isabella, daughter and heiress of Isabella and Ferdinand, and dreamed of uniting both thrones under one bed. The Catholic sovereigns agreed, on condition that Manuel expel from Portugal all unbaptized Jews, native or immigrant. Loving honors above honor, Manuel consented and ordered all Jews and Moors in his realm to accept baptism or banishment, in 1496. Finding that only a few preferred baptism, and loath to disrupt the trades and crafts in which the Jews excelled, he ordered all Jewish children under fifteen to be separated from their parents and forcibly baptized. The Catholic clergy opposed this measure, but it was carried out. I have seen, reported a bishop, many children dragged to the font by the hair. Some Jews killed their children and then themselves in protest. Manuel grew ferocious. He hindered the departure of Jews then ordered them to be baptized by force. They were dragged to the churches by the beards of the men and the hair of the women, and many killed themselves on the way. The Portuguese conversos sent a dispatch to Pope Alexander VI, begging his intercession. His reply is unknown. It was probably favorable, for Manuel now, in May 1497, granted to all forcibly baptized Jews a moratorium of twenty years during which they were not to be brought before any tribunal on a charge of adhering to Judaism. But the Christians of Portugal resented the economic competition of the Jews, baptized or not. When one Jew questioned the miracle alleged to have occurred in a Lisbon church, the populace tore him to pieces, this in 1506. For three days massacre ran free. Two thousand Jews were killed, hundreds of them were buried alive. Catholic prelates denounced the outrage, and two Dominican friars who had incited the riot were put to death. Otherwise, for a generation, there was almost peace. From Spain the terrible exodus was complete, but religious unity was not yet achieved. The Moors remained. Granada had been taken, but its Mohammedan population had been guaranteed religious liberty. Archbishop Hernando de Talavera, commissioned to govern Granada, scrupulously observed this compact and sought to make converts by kindness and justice. Jimenez did not approve such Christianity. He persuaded the queen that faith need not be kept with infidels, and induced her to decree in 1499 that the Moors must become Christians or leave Spain. Going himself to Granada, he overruled Talavera, closed the mosques, made public bonfires of all the Arabic books and manuscripts he could lay his hands on, and supervised wholesale compulsory christenings. The Moors washed the holy water from their children as soon as they were out of the priest's sight. Revolts broke out in the city and the province. They were crushed. By a royal edict of February 12, 1502, all Moslems in Castile and Leon were given till April 30th to choose between Christianity and exile. The Moors protested that when their forefathers had ruled much of Spain, they had given religious liberty, with rare exceptions, to the Christians under their sway, but the sovereigns were not moved. Boys under 14 and girls under 12 were forbidden to leave Spain with their parents, and feudal barons were allowed to retain their Moorish slaves, provided these were kept in fetters. Thousands departed, the rest accepted baptism more philosophically than the Jews. And as Moriscos, they took the place of the baptized Jews in suffering the penalties of the Inquisition for relapses into their former faith. During the sixteenth century, three million superficially converted Moslems left Spain. Cardinal Richelieu called the Edict of 1502 the most barbarous in history. But the Friar Bleda thought it the most glorious event in Spain since the time of the Apostles. Now, he added, religious unity is secured, and an era of prosperity is certainly about to dawn.
Spain lost an incalculable treasure by the exodus of Jewish and Muslim merchants, craftsmen, scholars, physicians, and scientists, and the nations that received them benefited economically and intellectually. Knowing henceforth only one religion, the Spanish people submitted completely to their clergy and surrendered all right to think except within the limits of the traditional faith. For good or ill, Spain chose to remain medieval, while Europe, by the commercial, typographical, intellectual, and Protestant revolutions, rushed into modernity. 7. Spanish Art Spanish architecture, persistently Gothic, powerfully expressed this enduring medieval mood. The people did not grudge the Maravedis that helped royal and noble conscience money, or religious policy, to build immense cathedrals, and to lavish costly ornaments and awesome sculpture and painting upon their favorite saints and the passionately worshipped Mother of God. Barcelona's cathedral rose slowly between 1298 and 1448. Amid the chaos of minor streets, it lifts its towering columns, an undistinguished portal, a majestic nave, while its many fountained cloisters still give refuge from the strife of the day. Valencia, Toledo, Burgos, Lerida, Tarragona, Saragossa, León, extended or embellished their pre-existing temples, while new ones rose at Huesca and Pamplona, whose cloisters of white marble, elegantly carved, are as fair as the Alhambra's patios. In 1401 the cathedral chapter at Seville resolved to erect a church so great and so beautiful that those who in coming ages shall look upon it will think us lunatics for attempting it. The architects removed the decayed mosque that stood on the chosen site, but kept its foundations, its ground plan, and its noble Giralda minaret. All through the fifteenth century stone rose upon stone until Seville had raised the largest Gothic edifice in the world. So that, said Théophile Gautier, Notre Dame de Paris might walk erect in the nave. However, Notre Dame is perfect. Seville Cathedral is vast. Sixty-seven sculptors and thirty-eight painters from Murillo to Goya toiled to adorn this mammoth cave of the gods. About 1410, the architect Guillermo Boffi proposed to the cathedral chapter of Girona to remove the columns and arches that divided the interior into nave and aisles, and to unite the walls by a single vault seventy-three feet wide. It was done, and the nave of Girona Cathedral has now the broadest Gothic vault in Christendom. It was a triumph for engineering, a defeat for art. Shrines not so stupendous rose in the fifteenth century at Perpignan, Manresa, Astorga, and Valladolid. Segovia crowned itself with a fortress-like cathedral in 1472. Siguenza finished its famous cloisters in 1507. Salamanca began its new fane in 1513. In almost every major city of Spain, barring Madrid, a cathedral rises in overwhelming majesty of external mass, with interiors darkly deprecating the sun and terrifying the soul into piety, yet brilliant with the high colors of Spanish painting and painted statuary and the gleam of jewelry, silver, and gold. These are the homes of the Spanish spirit, fearfully subdued and fiercely proud. Nevertheless, the king's nobles and cities found funds for costly palaces, Peter the Cruel, Ferdinand and Isabella, and Charles V remodeled the Alcazar that a Moorish architect had designed at Seville in 1181. Most of the reconstruction was done by Moors from Granada, so that the edifice is a weak sister of the Alhambra. In like Saracenic style, Don Pedro Enriquez built for the Dukes of Alcala at Seville, around 1500 and following, a lordly palace, the Casa de Pilatos, supposedly duplicating the house from whose portico Pilate was believed to have surrendered Christ to crucifixion. Valencia's Audiencia, or Hall of Audience, of 1500, provided for the local cortes a Salon Dorado, whose splendor challenged the Sala del Major Concilio and the Palace of the Doges at Venice. Sculpture was still a servant of architecture and the faith crowding Spanish churches with virgins in marble, metal, stone, or wood. Here, piety was petrified into forms of religious intensity or ascetic severity, enhanced with color and made more awe-inspiring by the profound gloom of the naves. Retables, carved and painted screens, raised behind the altar table, were a special pride of Spanish art. Great sums, usually bequeathed in terror of death, 
were spent to gather and maintain the most skillful workers, designers, carvers, doradores, who gilded or damascened the surfaces, estofadores, who painted the garments and ornaments, and canadores, who colored the parts representing flesh, all labored together or by turns on the propitiatory shrine. Behind the central altar of Seville Cathedral, a retable of forty-five compartments, built between 1483 and 1519, pictured beloved legends in painted or gilded statuary of late Gothic style, while another in the chapel of St. James in Toledo Cathedral displayed in gilt larchwood and stern realism the career of Spain's most honored saint. Princes and prelates might be represented in sculpture, but only on their tombs, which were placed in churches or monasteries conceived as the antechambers of paradise. So Doña Mencia Enriquez, Duchess of Albuquerque, was buried in a finely chiseled sepulcher now in the Hispanic Society Museum in New York, and Pablo Ortiz carved for the Cathedral of Toledo sumptuous sarcophagi for Don Alvaro de Luna and his wife. In the Carthusian Monastery of Miraflores, near Burgos, Il de Siloé designed in Italian style a superb mausoleum for the parents and brothers of the Queen. Isabella was so pleased with these famous sepulcros de los reyes that when her favorite page, Juan de Padilla, so recklessly brave that she called him mi loco, my fool, was shot through the head at the siege of Granada, she commissioned de Siloé to carve a tomb of royal quality to harbor his corpse, and Hill again rivaled the best Italian sculpture of his time. No art is more distinctive than the Spanish, yet none has more devoutly submitted to foreign influence. First, of course, to the Moorish influence, long domiciled in the peninsula, but having its roots in Mesopotamia and Persia, and bringing into the Iberian style a delicacy of workmanship and a passion for ornament hardly equaled in any other Christian land. In the minor arts, where decoration was most in place, Spain imitated and never surpassed her Saracenic preceptors. Pottery was left almost entirely to the Mudejares, whose lustered ware was rivaled only by the Chinese, and whose colored tiles, above all the blue azulejos, glorified the floors, altars, fountains, walls, and roofs of Christian Spain. The same Moorish skill made Spanish textiles, velvets, silks, and lace, the finest in Christendom. It appears again in Spanish leather, in the arabesques of the metal screens, in the religious monstrances, in the wood carving of the retables, choir stalls, and vaults. Later influences seeped in from Byzantine painting, then from France, Burgundy, the Netherlands, Germany. From the Dutch and the Germans, Spanish sculpture and painting derived their startling realism. Emaciated virgins, graphically old enough to be the mother of the crucified, despite Michelangelo's dictum about virginity and bombing youth. In the sixteenth century all these influences receded before the continent-wide triumph of the Italian style. Spanish painting followed a similar evolution, but developed tardily, perhaps because the Moors gave here no help or lead. The Catalan frescoes of the twelfth and thirteenth centuries are inferior in design to the Altamira cave paintings of prehistoric Spain. Yet by 1300 painting had become a craze in the peninsula. A thousand artists painted immense murals, huge altarpieces. Some of these, from as early as 1345, have survived much longer than they deserved. In 1428, Jan van Eyck visited Spain, importing a powerful Flemish influence. Three years later, the King of Aragon sent Luis Dalmau to study in Bruges. Returning, Luis painted an all-too-Flemish version of the counselors. Thereafter, Spanish painters, though still preferring tempera, more and more mixed their colors in oil. The age of the primitives in Spanish painting culminated in Bartolomé Bermejo, who died in 1498. As early as 1447, he made a name for himself with the Santo Domingo that hangs in the Prado. The Santa Engracia, bought by the Gardner Museum of Boston, and the gleaming St. Michael of Lady Ludlow's collection are almost worthy of Raphael, who came a generation later. But best of all is the Pieta of 1490 in the Barcelona Cathedral, a bald, bespectacled Jerome, a dark and Spanish Mary holding her limp, haggard, lifeless son, in the background, the towers of Jerusalem under a lowering sky, and on the right, a ruthless portrait of the donor, Canon Despla, uncombed and unshaved, resembling a bandit, penitent but condemned, and suggesting Bermejo's doer conception of humanity. Here Italian grace is transformed into Spanish force, and realism celebrates its triumph in Spanish art.
The Flemish influence continued in Fernando Gallegos, and it produced a startling masterpiece in A Knight of the Order of Calatrava by Miguel Citium, a Fleming in the service of Isabella. This is one of the finest portraits in the National Gallery in Washington. But then again the Italian influence rose when Pedro Berughete returned to Spain after a long experience in Italy. There he studied with Piero della Francesca and Melozzo da Forli and absorbed their quiet Umbrian style. When Federigo of Urbino sought painters to adorn his palace, he chose Justus von Ghent and Pietro Spagnolo. After the Duke's death in 1582, Pedro brought the Umbrian art to Spain and painted famous altarpieces at Toledo and Avila. The pictures ascribed to him in the Louvre, the Brera, the Prado, and the Cleveland Museum hardly support his present reclame as the Velázquez of the Catholic sovereigns, but in drawing and composition they seem superior to anything produced in Spain before him. Slowly the foreign stimuli were blending with the native genius to prepare for the maturer works of Alonso Coelho and El Greco under Philip II, and the triumphs of Velázquez, Zurbaran, and Murillo in the golden age of Spain's seventeenth century. Genius is an individual endowment of force and will, but it is also a social heredity of discipline and skills formed in time and absorbed in growth. Genius is born and made. 8. Spanish Literature In letters, the Italian ascendancy had to wait while Spain exchanged influences with medieval France. It was probably from Moslem and Christian Spain that the troubadours of Provence had taken their poetic forms and conceits. Nevertheless, John I of Aragon sent an embassy to Charles VI of France in 1388, asking for troubadours from Toulouse to come to Barcelona and organize there a branch of their fraternity, the Gay Saber, or Joyful Wisdom. It was done. At Barcelona and Tortosa, poetic contests were held in Provençal fashion, and the composition and recitation of verses became a passion among the literate minority in Aragon and Castile. Lyrics of love or faith or war were sung by wandering juglares to a simple accompaniment of strings. In the next generation, John II of Castile supported Italian models of poetry. Through Naples and Sicily, where Spaniards ruled, and through the University of Bologna, where Spanish youths like the Borgias studied, Italian moods and meters of verse swept into the peninsula, and Dante and Petrarch found eager emulators in the Castilian tongue. Periodically, the lyrics of the Spanish poets were collected in cancioneros, books of ballads chivalric in sentiment, Petrarchan in style. The Marques de Santillana, statesman, scholar, patron, poet, imported the sonnet form from Italy and compiled so soon a history of Spanish literature. Juan de Mena candidly imitated Dante in an epic poem, The Labyrinth, which did almost as much to establish Castilian as a literary language as the Divine Comedy had done for the Tuscan speech. Meanwhile, Don Juan Manuel anticipated Boccaccio by writing dramatic tales, from one of which Shakespeare drew the quite incredible legend of Petruchio's Taming of a Shrew. Romance continued to entrance all classes of readers. Amadish de Gaula was translated into Spanish circa 1500 by Garcia Ordonez, who assured his readers that he had vastly improved upon the Portuguese original and as this is lost, we cannot gainsay him. Amadish, illegitimate son of an imaginary British princess, is exposed by her mother on the sea. He is rescued by a Scottish knight and becomes a page to the Queen of Scotland. Lisuarte, King of England, leaves his ten-year-old daughter Oriana at the Scottish court while he suppresses a usurper in his realm. The Queen assigns the twelve-year-old Amadish as a page to Oriana, saying, This is a child who shall serve you. And she answered that it pleased her, and the child kept this word in his heart, in such wise that it never afterwards left it, and he was never in all the days of his life wearied with serving her. And this their love lasted as long as they lasted, but Amadish, who knew not at all how she loved him, held himself to be very bold in that he had placed his thoughts on her, considering both her greatness and her beauty, and never so much as dared to speak a word concerning it. And she too, though she loved him in her heart, took heed that she should not speak with him more than with another. But her eyes took great solace in showing to her heart what thing in the world she most loved. It is a comfort to know that their love was triumphantly consummated, after tribulations as numerous before marriage in fiction as after it in life. 
There are many moments of tenderness and some of nobility in the long story, and Cervantes, vowing to destroy all such romances, spared this one as the best. Romance provided one source of the drama, which slowly evolved out of the mystery and morality plays, the popular farces, and the court masks. The oldest date in the history of the Spanish drama is 1492, when the dramatic dialogues of Juan de Lencina were put upon the stage. Fernando de Rojas, a converso, took a further step toward drama in La Celestina in 1499, a story told throughout in dialogue and divided into twenty-two acts. It was too long to be staged, but its vivid characterizations and sprightly dialogue prepared for the classic comedies of Spain. Scholarship was both hampered and fostered by the Church. While the Inquisition police thought, leading ecclesiastics did much for learning and education. Italians like Pietro Martire d'Anghiera, coming to Spain in 1487, brought the news of the humanist movement, and Spaniards educated in Italy returned with the enthusiastic infection. At the Queen's request, Peter Martyr opened at her court, as Alcuin had done for Charlemagne seven centuries before, a school of classical languages and literatures. Princess Juana studied Latin dutifully on the way to insanity. Peter himself wrote the first history of the discoveries in America, under the title De Rebus Oceanis et Novo Orbe, in 1504 and following. The last two words shared with Vespucci's earlier possibly around 1502, use of the term to name the New World. Cardinal Jimenez, whose faith was as firm and sharp as steel, joined actively in the classical movement. In 1499 he founded the College of San Ildefonso, and in 1508 the University of Alcalá. There in 1502, nine linguists under his supervision began one of the major achievements of Renaissance scholarship, the Biblia Polyglota Compluti, or Complutensian Polyglot Bible, the first complete edition of the Christian scriptures in the original languages. Complutum, or fruitful, was the old Latin name of Alcala. To the Masoretic Hebrew text of the Old Testament and the Greek of the New, the editors added, in parallel or subjoint columns, the Septuagint Greek translation, the Latin Vulgate version by Jerome, and a Syriac paraphrase of the Pentateuch. Leo X opened up for Jimenez's staff the manuscripts of the Vatican Library, and three baptized Jews contributed their Hebraic learning. The work of editing was completed in 1517, but the six volumes were not printed till 1522. Jimenez, anticipating death, urged on his savants, Lose no time in the prosecution of our glorious task, lest in the casualties of life you lose your patron or I have to lament the loss of those whose services are of greater price in my eyes than the wealth and honors of the world. A few months before he died, the final volume was presented to him with the compliments of his friends. Of all the acts of his administration, he told them, there was none better entitled than this to their congratulations. He projected an edition of Aristotle on the same scale with a new Latin translation, but the brevity of his long life defeated him. 9. Sovereign Death Isabella had preceded her energetic minister in the culminating adventure. With all her severity, she was a woman of deep sensitivity, who bore bereavements more heavily than wars. In 1496 she buried her mother. Of her ten children, five were stillborn or died in infancy, and two others died in early youth. In 1497 she lost her only son, her sole hope for an orderly succession, and in 1498 her best-beloved daughter, the Queen of Portugal, who might have united the peninsula in peace. Amid these blows she suffered the daily tragedy of seeing her daughter Juana, now heiress apparent to the throne, slowly going insane. Juana had married Philip the Handsome, Duke of Burgundy, and son of the Emperor Maximilian I in 1496. By him she bore two future emperors, Charles V and Ferdinand I. Whether because of a fickle temperament or because Juana was already incompetent, Philip neglected her and carried on a liaison with a lady of her court at Brussels. Juana had the charmer's hair cut off, whereupon Philip swore he would never cohabit with his wife again. Hearing of all this, Isabella fell ill. On October 12, 1504, she wrote her will directing that she should receive the plainest funeral, that the money so saved should be given to the poor, and that she should be buried in a Franciscan monastery within the Alhambra but, she added, 
Should the king, my lord, prefer his sepulchre in some other place, then my will is that my body should be transported and laid by his side, that the union which we have enjoyed in this world and through the mercy of God may hope again for our souls in heaven, may be represented by our bodies in the earth. She died November 24, 1504, and was buried as she had directed. But after Ferdinand's death, her remains were placed beside his in the Cathedral of Granada. The world, wrote Peter Martyr, has lost its noblest ornament. I know none of her sex in ancient or modern times who in my judgment is at all worthy to be named with this incomparable woman. Margaret of Sweden had been too remote from Peter's ken, and Elizabeth of England was still to be. Isabella's will had named Ferdinand as regent in Castile for a Philip absorbed in the Netherlands and a Juana moving ever more deeply into a consoling lunacy. Hoping to keep the Spanish throne from falling to the Habsburgs in the person of Philip's son Charles, the 53-year-old Ferdinand hurriedly married in 1505 Germaine de Foix, the 17-year-old niece of Louis XII. But the marriage increased the distaste of the Castilian nobles for their Aragonese master, and its only offspring died in infancy. Philip now claimed the crown of Castile, arrived in Spain, and was welcomed by the nobility in 1506, while Ferdinand retired to his role as King of Aragon. Three months later Philip died, and Ferdinand resumed the regency of Castile in the name of his mad daughter. Juana la Loca remained technically queen. She lived till 1555, but never, after 1507, left her royal palace at Tordesillas. She refused to wash or be dressed, and day after day she gazed through a window at the cemetery that held the remains of the unfaithful husband, whom she had never ceased to love. Ferdinand ruled more absolutely as regent than before as king. Freed from the tempering influence of Isabella, the hard and vindictive elements in his character came to sharp dominance. He had already recovered Roussillon and Cerdagne in 1493, and Gonzalo de Córdoba had conquered Naples for him in 1503. This violated an agreement signed by Philip with Louis XII at Lyon for the division of the kingdom of Naples between Spain and France. Ferdinand assured the world that Philip had exceeded his instructions. He sailed to Naples and took personal possession of the Neapolitan throne in 1506. He suspected that Gonzalo wanted this seat for himself. When he returned to Spain in 1507, he brought the Gran Capitan with him and consigned him to a retirement that most of Spain considered an unmerited humiliation. Ferdinand had mastered everything but time. Gradually the wells of will and energy in him sank. His hours of rest grew longer, fatigue came sooner, he neglected the government, he became impatient and restless, morbidly suspicious of his most loyal servitors. Dropsy and asthma weakened him, he could hardly breathe in cities. In January 1516 he fled south to Andalusia, where he hoped to spend the winter in the open country. He fell ill on the way and was at last persuaded to prepare for death. He named Jimenez regent for Castile, and his own illegitimate son, the Archbishop of Saragossa, regent for Aragon. He died January 23, 1516, in the 64th year of his life, the 42nd of his reign. No wonder Machiavelli admired him. Here was a king who acted the prince before its author thought of writing it. Ferdinand made religion a tool of national and military policy, filled his documents with pious phrases, but never allowed considerations of morality to overcome motives of expediency or gain. No one could doubt his ability, his competent supervision of the government, his discerning choice of ministers and generals, his invariable success in diplomacy, persecution, and war. Personally, he was neither greedy nor extravagant. His appetite was for power rather than for luxury, and his greed was for his country to make it one and strong. He had no belief in democracy. Under him, local liberties languished and died. He was readily convinced that the old communal institutions could not be expanded to govern successfully a nation of so many states, faiths, and tongues. His achievement, and Isabella's, was to replace anarchy with monarchy, weakness with strength. He paved the way for Charles V to maintain the royal supremacy despite long absences, and for Philip II to concentrate all the government in one inadequate head. To accomplish this he was guilty of what to our time seems barbarous intolerance and inhuman cruelty but seemed to his contemporaries a glorious victory for Christ. Jimenez, as regent, zealously preserved the absolutism of the throne, perhaps as an alternative to a relapse into feudal fragmentation. Though now eighty years old, he ruled Castile with inflexible will, 
and defeated every effort of the feudality or the municipalities to regain their former powers. When some nobles asked by what right he curbed their privileges, he pointed not to the insignia of office on his person, but to the artillery in the courtyard of the palace. Yet his will to power was subordinated to his sense of duty, for he repeatedly urged the young King Charles to leave Flanders and come to Spain to assume the royal authority. When Charles came on September 17, 1517, Jimenez hurried north to meet him. But Charles's Flemish counselors had seconded the Castilian nobles in giving him so unfavorable a report of the cardinal's administration and character that the king, still an immature youth of seventeen, dispatched a letter to Jimenez thanking him for his services, deferring an interview, and bidding him retire to his see at Toledo for a merited rest. Another letter, dismissing the old zealot from all political office, reached him too late to deepen his humiliation. He had died on November 8, 1517, aged 81. People wondered how, though apparently incorruptible, he had amassed the great personal fortune that his will left to the University of Alcala. He ended for Spain, an age rich in honors, horrors, and forceful men. The aftermath suggests that the victory of the crown over Cortes and communes removed the medium through which the Spanish character might have expressed and maintained independence and variety, that the unification of faith was secured at the cost of riveting upon Spain a machine for the suppression of original thought on first and last things, that the expulsion of unconverted Jews and Moors undermanned Spanish commerce and industry just when the opening of the new world called for economic expansion and improvement, that the progressive involvement of Spain in the politics and wars of France and Italy, later of Flanders, Germany, and England, instead of turning policy and enterprise toward the development of the Americas, laid unbearable burdens upon the nation's resources in money and men. This, however, is hindsight, and judges the Spain of Ferdinand and Isabella in terms that no European people of their time would have understood. All religious groups, except for a few Moslems and Anabaptists, persecuted religious dissent. All governments, Catholic France and Italy, Protestant Germany and England, used force to unify religious faith. All countries hungered for the gold of the Indies, east or west. All used war and diplomatic deceit to ensure their survival, extend their boundaries, or increase their wealth. To all Christian governments, Christianity was not a rule of means, but a means of rule. Christ was for the people, Machiavelli was preferred by the kings. The state, in some measure, had civilized man, but who would civilize the state? This book is continued on Cassette 9, Side 1.